Hi, my name is Mark Bauer. I live outside of Fort Worth, Texas, and today I intend to install two exhaust fans for my metal building. I've got a metal building about 35 by 45 square feet and uh, has no fans. Uh, gets really hot here in Texas and I do a lot of woodworking so I got a lot of sawdust that stays up in the air and I need to get that exhausted so I bought two 24 inch um, exhaust fans. They, um, they're, it's a Max Air IF24, the 24s for 24 inch, and um, they require a rough cutout of 28 and a quarter inch square. And so today I'm actually going to cut the hole for the, at least the first exhaust fan, and we're going to install it. Uh, today we're going to put in an exhaust fan into a metal building. Um, I know I can do it because I'm putting in two of them and I did the first one already and it came out real well and so I'm going to carefully go step by step as I put in the second one and show you how I did it. Um, I'm surprised at how few video YouTube videos I can find uh, that show how to put an exhaust fan into a metal building. There's several out there that do the uh, wood barns and such but it's kind of tricky with the metal buildings with the um, panel profiles on the outside that make it a little bit trickier than say a flat wood siding building um, here's the inside and i've you'll see you see there i've got some one by six framing around it to help uh, besides making it look better it, it it keeps the draft from coming in and it closes up some gaps there and i'll show you the outside in just a minute uh, one of the first steps you need to do is you know you unpack it and be sure to put it up and test it um, don't lay it flat on the ground because you want it to be able to actually intake some air so you see the slats here allows some air gaps there so that it can actually work uh, the reason for that is uh, there's a lot of things that can go wrong with these fans one is of course is the motor the electric motor may not run, although I'm sure the reliability of those motors are pretty good. But it turns out the very first one that I was about to install, I did a little test run. And it turns out the lower shutter, the, this lower louver, was trapped. It was installed incorrectly. It was trapped behind this permanent lip right here. And there was no way to get it free without bending the, the shutter. And I didn't want to do that, so I contacted the manufacturer and we got it all worked out and i got it fixed but i i'm glad i did it before i installed it it would have been a pain in the butt to try to do it after it had been installed it was much easier to do that in in the garage so don't skip this step be sure to test your fan uh, a lot of them come with just a piece of wire I, it turns out i had a plug left over from some appliance that i threw away but i kept the plug and i temporarily have wired it up i got the ground wires bolted together they both came with a little eyelet so it made it easy just to bolt them and then i got your standard wing um, uh, wire nuts there for the white and the black um, electrical cord so i'm going to plug it in right now and we're going to test it out be sure everything works Yeah, again, before you install one of these exhaust fans, be sure to test it while it's on the ground to not only be sure the electric motor works, but to also be sure the louvers uh, operate correctly with the fan running. sure the louvers close a little bit uh, I don't know if it's this particular brand but I'm sure they're all they all are bad about not closing quite all the way of course they're the bearings and the fittings are always made by the lowest bidder so <laughs> you, you always get what you pay for but anyway uh, it seems to be operating correctly and uh so we i feel more comfortable going forward to, to install it 
So here's the finished product for my first fan on the outside. Uh, you'll notice it's, I've got some brown framing around it that makes it look good and it closes off the gaps and uh, and generally is also a little security measure since the framing hides the fasteners that tie the exhaust fan to the building. I want to point out that I was able to find these uh, uh, wood fillers. It's a wood frame that fits the mold line of the actual R panel building siding. This particular siding is very common in Texas. It's two uh, big major ridges with two minor ridges uh, that repeat every 12 inches. And um, I was surprised how difficult it was to find uh, any kind of filler that fit that mold line. So Hazlitt Products uh, has the items that, that worked out here that you see on both the vertical and horizontal framing there. And uh, I was real happy with it and it worked out real well. Here's uh, for the second frame, here's a, here it is unpainted. Uh, you'll see it's got primer on it. And you see how it's got these four uh, segments, if you will, that fit and nest. Let's see if I can do this one-handed while holding the camera. But it nests right in up against the, the siding of the building. I don't have it pressed in so it looks like a bad gapping condition, but anyway, it fits the mold line, uh, fills the gap. Of course, I'll put sealant between the on that fading surface between the the filler and the building siding, and and it and it'll make a good fit there. This is a uh, again Hazlitt product. This is the horizontal piece. Keep in mind when you do order these pieces that the horizontal. Uh, piece is of course is designed totally different from the vertical piece because of the asymmetry of the R panel building panel design there so uh, when you open up your box for your exhaust fan of course you will get at least a sheet or two for instructions these uh, exhaust fans are notorious for not having any instructions. Uh, you you got to either know how to do it or, or hope for the best and uh, hope you do it right. Uh, incidentally, it gives you, and I hope you can read this, and I'll, I'll send you a link otherwise, but it, there's a column here for rough opening. Be careful, the, the instruction sheet is gen almost always has multiple model numbers, generally fan diameters are, are printed on one sheet of paper. So be sure you're reading the correct line for the fan that you actually got. I got a 24 inch fan, so it's the third line down. And so my rough opening is gonna be 28 and a quarter by 28 and a quarter. So anyway, just be careful about reading your instructions. Be sure you read the right numbers. Be sure it makes sense. Get out your measuring tape and be sure it's about 28 and a quarter that would fit the, the size of that fan. I'm sure people who install these exhaust fans all the time probably don't have to do this, but uh, as a helpful aid to be sure I'm making the cut out in the right place, I got a piece of cardboard and cut it out to be exactly the same as a rough opening. So this is 28 and a quarter by 28 and a quarter square piece of uh, cardboard. So I'll be able to hold it up against the wall here uh, inside my shop to figure out exactly where I want the cut out to be. Uh, just to let you know, the, my building here uses R-panel siding, and we'll go into more detail on the details of the R-panel siding. Um, I, I, on the inside, the, when I bought the building, it was already insulated, so it's got about a one-inch uh, thick foam-looking uh, insulation with chicken wire holding it up. So one of the first things I've got to do is, once I figure out exactly where I'm going to do the cutout, I've got to cut the chicken wire and cut the insulation so I can even get to the metal part of the building so I can make the cutout. Uh, uh, here we are up on the mezzanine, uh, close to where the fan will be installed. Um, I'm going to frame the opening uh, both on the 
oil mail and I aim at the outer and the inner side of the of the surface here and so I don't want to be right next to any structure like the post here or any of these runners uh, they would get in the way you could do it but you'll end up having those custom make a bunch of stuff to make your framing work so I want to stay a good I want to stay about seven inches away there's about six five so it looks like I'll be able to stay five and a half inches away and what I intend is uh, is to frame about five and a half inch wide framing and I'll tell you why in, in a little bit later and uh, what I'll use that framing for is to hold down the insulation and the chicken wire so that I'll trap it under the framing so I don't have to mess with some kind of ugly staple job or something later on so anyway I'm going to mark the fan right about there and that's about symmetrical with how I want it done and so I want to turn the camera off so I can mark it and we'll start clipping the wires okay I've marked the rough opening uh, we'll be able to clip the wires a, a little beyond the opening actually as much as an inch or two beyond the mark I made because we're going to put framing up that's going to trap that and, and uh, hold down the insulation. This chicken wire a little beyond where I need it. We'll try about an inch beyond the marks right now. Okay, so there's the wire, the chicken wire that holds the insulation. And now the next step will be to, I'm going to take a box cutter and cut out the actual insulation here. It's only about an inch thick. Um, and I'm going to go a little beyond the mark uh, because when we make the cut, we've got to get down to the bare metal and you don't want insulation or wire especially in the way. I might actually have to go back and cut the chicken wire and the insulation even further away so I can be sure I get a clean cut with my uh, metal cutting saw. So, uh, but right now, just to keep the damage to a minimum, as a doctor, I'm trying not to do any harm. Um, I'm going to just try an inch away from the mark right now. We'll see how that works. Okay, there's the cut. Now the, the blade didn't exactly get all the way oh, through the insulation, so we've got to rip it a little bit. Okay, and there's the actual metal siding itself. Now the next task, of course, is to cut this metal paneling. It's about 22 gauge thick, not very thick, less than an eighth inch. Um, you got several options. If you've got a sawzall and you can control it well, that'd be one method. Um, there's there's several others. Uh, I went ahead and made it, the, since this gave me an excuse to buy a new tool, I went ahead and got a DeWalt circular metal cutting saw, and I'll show you that in just a minute. Okay, um, I cut 
father on the insulation and chicken wire by about an inch. And I'm, I'm going to mark where the actual cutout will be in the actual metal siding. The problem is I'm still too close. I've, if it's too close to even draw a line, it's gonna to be too close for my circular saw. This stuff is gonna get in the way. But I'm hesitant to cut away more material because I don't have to fight making it look good later on. So what I'm gonna do is cut diagonals, maybe about five inches on all at each corner and I'm going to temporarily roll the insulation and chicken wire out of the way and tape it down or wire it away. So it's out of the way, but I'll be able to put it back. I'm not sure if these snips will be the tool to use, but we'll find out. Oh yeah, this will work. idea is to get this out of the way and I'll do similar with each side here okay it's a struggle to figure out how to hold this insulation back the ones on the side that aren't near a post Pretty easy. I'm putting two pieces of wood back to back, and then I'm just using a simple bar clamp there to hold it back. Gravity's going to keep this down. Looks like pretty good. Problem with this one is it's got a steel beam in the way. I can't get my clamps behind it, and the tape isn't holding. The blue tape, of course, doesn't hold very well. It's not sticking, of course, to the actual insulation. Um, I think I can live with it though because I can see my pencil line here. So we're going to give this a try real quick. So one more time, I'm going to put up my cutout. This is 28 and one quarter per the instructions. I already did one side. and So one side is is parallel to the actual ridge of the siding. I'm, I should not have to use a level. Hopefully they did that when they built the building. I'm going to go ahead and mark what I've got. But I will double check to be sure everything's level, but it's looking good. This looks parallel. Oh, crap. If you're like me, you generally have to do a lot of work by yourself. So you wish you had three arms. So ah. let's see if I got enough marks there. That looks pretty good. I'm gonna double check it with my tape measure. Again, we're looking for 28 and one quarter. Yeah, it's a little less. Uh, incidentally, one trick if you got the room, there's always a little question of how accurate tape measures are, especially these big ones with the loose hook. The hook is supposed to be loose so that you can hook it and it'll, it takes out the slack and then when you push it, it goes in. It's made to be slotted so it's a, supposed to be an accurate measure both ways. But another way to do it is start on say the number two here. Generally I like to start on the number 10 so it's a very easy <laughs> means of adding up. Sure enough I can do it. I, I thought the insulation would be in the way but I'm starting with the 10 on one side and I'm looking at 38, 38 and the 8 so I'm it's going to be a little tighter over here. I'll, I might redo that line and also start with the 10 here and this is a little large, this is 38 and a half, which is actually 28 and a half, a little less, 3 eighths. So it's 28 and 3 eighths, a little bit larger on that side. So anyway, close enough, it's going to, I think when I actually do my cut, I'll be lucky with if I'm within an eighth of 
either of those. So we'll see how it goes. Seeing how I have the new project cutting into a metal building, I don't do a lot of metal work. I'm a woodworker. Of course, like every woodworker, you do some metal working occasionally. But uh, this is pretty significant to cut a big cutout in the middle of your building. Uh, I went ahead and looked for a, a good cutting saw, and I got this DeWalt. Um, let me get my reading glasses on. And I guess I didn't realize it's, it is specifically for metal cutting. I thought that I, I could use a cut, you know, a, uh, oh, a trim saw and just put in a metal cutting blade. And I'm sure you can do that too. But I purchased this. Uh, it's a 5 and 3 8 diameter bladed. Uh, it uses a 5 and 3 8 diameter blades. And it's a DeWalt DCS373. That's DCS373. And it says 5 and a half inch diameter uh, cutting blades. And so, uh, and it's specifically a metal cutting saw. Now the difference between woodworking and metal working saws, generally, the problem with cutting metal with woodworking saws, even if you have the correct blade, is that metal shavings will generally get into your the actual motor. And over time, it may take years, but it will generally wear out your woodworking equipment rapidly if you use it for metal cutting significantly. I'm assuming that these metal cutting saws have a slightly different uh, motor design uh, such that it protects the motor from the, the slivers of metal uh, that occur. Um, so I'm trying to get worked up to cut the siding here. I'm trying to decide if I want to put up a straight edge. It's just going to be too hard. There's nothing to clamp it to easily and I'm just going to have to freehand this. Of course, I'm going to have my uh, ear protection and eye protection, and uh, <clears throat> uh, whatever tool you're using to cut the metal siding, be sure if it has a depth of a the cutting blade has at least a depth of one and a one and a quarter to one and a half inches. Uh, this R panel contour technically has a thickness of one and one quarter, which does not include the thickness of the 22 gauge uh, metal itself. So be sure you, you've got at least an inch and a half uh, that you can cut through. Otherwise you're gonna end up cutting and you'll have these little gaps where it's still connected and you'll end up using a hacksaw or something. Okay, I'm gonna give this a try and we'll see how this works out. Okay, what I'm going to do <laughs> is redraw my lines with a with a felt tilt marker. This pencil line is a little bit too hard for me to see, both due to the sliding and through the goggles, and my eyesight's not that good anyway, so I want to be sure I stay on the line, and so I'm going to redo those lines. Okay, I uh, remarked the lines using a felt tilt marker and I double checked the values. I even used a level to be sure. And there was a slight adjustment, but not much. Uh, close enough for cutting in the metal, I'm sure. Um, incidentally, I was, as I'm dealing with trying to get these measuring tools, including this right, at, right angle to try to double check everything, Another, it gives you another advantage if you're away from these beams because if you are right up against one of the beams, it would create a whole other problem with not only getting your cutting tool in there, but also trying to get measuring tools also. So when you put your exhaust fan in, yeah, I strongly encourage you to stay away from beams and such. If you need the, the support of a beam, you can always build some supports, uh, scaffolding and such to to uh, be permanently installed to distribute the load into the beams if you need to, but otherwise I would stay away from the beams and any other weird uh, apparatus that's attached to the wall.
it's going to be easier for me to keep this motor on the inside. You can feel the metal shavings hitting you. You have got to wear eye protection minimum and ear protection. Notice I'm a little shy at the cutouts. So I'm not doing that on purpose. It's just that I, this is a new saw and I cannot quite make out where the end of the blade is. So I'd rather be shy than overcut. I can always get out a hacksaw and finish it off. to go backwards to connect to this cutout. Don't do that. I have to admit, one of the advantages of not connecting the corners is at least your panel stays up. That may be the correct way to do it. Uh, I'm going to try to... hard to try to go from the other direction. I'm going to go get a hacksaw, I guess. Uh, when I said I was going to get my hacksaw, uh, I, I took one look at it and realized that's no fun. Uh, I've got, they, get, they got name, different names for these. Uh, reciprocating saw, I believe is the correct term. Um, it's also called a sawzall and demolition saw. You change out the blade. I usually have a wood cutting blade. Uh, I just swapped it out to have a metal cutting blade. The, the one thing I don't like about these tools is there's a lot of slop in the blade itself. Uh, it has to do, be like that. Otherwise, they would break all the time because they're abused quite a bit. But anyway, uh, similar to most of the time it's used, this doesn't have to be that accurate. So. Um, Another problem with these, along with jigsaws that I dislike, is 
all the vibration that goes with it. Uh, I'm, I'm pretty sure once I hit this, this whole sheet's going to start vibrating, maybe even dangerously so. Um, but there's nothing that can be done about it. Again, I'll wear my eye and ear protection and we'll start cutting in just a minute. Generally, uh, just to let you know, when you do cut out something like this that's barely hanging in there, uh, cut your lower connections first so your upper connection kind of keeps it in form so that your final cut uh, releases the, the item. If you were to cut the upper ones first, it'll start folding over uh, or you know it'll start folding towards you, you can get in the way and sometimes you'll you ruin the part, you'll start bending. So cut your lower connections first, then your uppers. And then for your final cut, do your more difficult cut, like I got to cut up here. I won't do that first because you don't want to be in a weird position when the thing starts falling. Okay, for the final cut, looks like it's going to fall outside, which is fine with me. So there it is. I have got to put an exhaust fan in now. Or a window. I guess I could put a window if I give up. Uh, I'm going to frame around the outside of the cutout. Now here's the piece of metal that just fell out the side of the building. And uh, so what I'm talking about is actually on the outer perimeter of that cutout. But you can buy this uh, wood filler that fits the R panel design. Uh, this is 12 inches from peak to peak. And this is 4 inches with these minor peaks. Unfortunately, there's nothing symmetrical about the R panel design other than it's a repeating pattern. Uh, the, OML, the, the OML side and the IML side, the outer and the inner side, are totally different. So you can't use the same filler on one side as the other. It turns out though for the inside we're not going to use the any kind of form to fit the shape because I've got to trap the insulation in that chicken wire so I'm just going to use a flat piece and it's okay if it's not a super tight fit because it's on the inside of the building anyway. But for the outside I want to fit this around the perimeter a nice framing. Now this is the horizontal section for the R panel and this is for the upper and lower uh, horizontal pieces and then for the sides it's, it's a totally different item it comes in a wide section here and it fits fairly wide and you've got to rip it to the width that you need now what we're going to do is put this up against the side the cutout and, until it just peaks over till we can see an edge we'll clamp it mark it and then we'll cut a five and a half inch wide uh, frame if you will for one side and then we'll do the same thing for the other so then we'll have our upper and lower horizontals and then we'll have our verticals and we'll have our outer perimeter and the and the uh, frame will be nice and flat so that when we slide the fan in we'll have a nice flat surface to seal the uh, flange of the fan I uh, went ahead and cut the inside frame from just standard 1x6 lumber. As, as you well know, 1x6 lumber is actually 3 quarters of an inch thick and it's 5 and a half inches wide. Um, notice that I folded down the insulation and the chicken wire uh, so that I can clamp it up and, and hold it down so I don't have to deal with any kind of stapling or some ugly finish there. So that will solve the issue for the uh, trim around on the inside. 
it also gives me an, an advantage of this uh, interior frame also gives me a little bit of lip here to support the uh, the fan exhaust fan coming in and uh, I'll also have the next step will be to put the matching outer frame uh, on the on the outside there to get it ready for the fan we're going to try to frame the outside uh, right now uh, I've got this bar panel filler made of wood it's got a primer on it and uh, the goal is and the reason it's so wide is due to the R panel geometry uh, there's only certain positions that it can sit and unfortunately this cut here required my using this ex extra wide uh, detail that they Colt Engineering sells and so it's going to be cut right about here you see there's a major ridge right at this cut which has to be almost halfway in the middle of this detail which is fine again the framing is going to be five and a half inches wide to match a one by sixes and so I got plenty of room my hope is that the other side or the exhaust panel uh, exhaust fan on the other side of the barn will be able to use the rest of this so it's not going to go to waste but anyway what I'm going to do is put it on the outside set it in position and clamp it and then mark it I'm going to put a mark so that I know exactly where to place the cut and uh, to make it fit perfectly when you do an exhaust fan, you're going to want to, to be sure that you have enough material, you're going to have to order two vertical assemblies. It, it meets a lot of waste, but if you do a lot of these fans, uh, I did two of them and only had to order three of these because on the other fan, the waste material did work because the major ridge was not in the frame side of it. But you just, you got to be a gambler if you're not going to order enough material. So to be sure to see where to cut, you got to fit it in the in the ridges. There it is. I just want to be sure it's a good fit. I take my pencil. And I'm going to do hash marks to give me a hint which way is a waste so this is all waste material and I will cut I will rip this assembly all the way and then measure five and a half inches over and rip the other side and make my vertical frame it's almost exactly 28 inches we'll call that the bottom I got it sitting on the edge here The trick is not to drop it. Unfortunately, the R panel siding design is fairly large. It's 12 inches of a repeating pattern. So to get this major ridge portion of the pattern in the middle, it means a whole 24 inch width from end to end and actually this assembly is a little wider because the, the little flange here goes across the entire cap of the of the major ridge so I will now take this to my table saw and make my vertical frame component Okay, we're going to make our first cut to match the profile of the rough cutout for the exhaust fan. Um, try to ignore the fact that my line is at a cant. I'm going to, I'm sure that there's a mismatch uh, up at the top, but we're going to, I'm going to go ahead and cut a straight line that matches the profile of the ridges of the side of the building. And uh, hopefully we can adjust for it uh, at the end when we install the fan. This is a saw stop. It's got a little computer in it. Have to wait for the green light. 
Uh, this is the saw that protects you in case you are about to cut your finger off. Hopefully you won't see that today. And now uh, that we got the inner edge of the outer frame here, I'm going to cut it to width. It's going to be five and a half inches. Uh, five and a half inches wide, so it will be much easier to manage this assembly when it's to actual width. So we have our right hand outer frame cut for one side and now we're going to do a fit check using these scrap pieces from that last cut to see if we can use these. And no problem, this is going to fit real well. I just need to mark the straight edge that we cut. And I'm going to go ahead and mark up and left. And we'll make that cut. This will be our waist side here. And we'll trim this down to five and a half inches also. Okay, we're about to make the first cut for this uh, next uh, outer frame. One of the hassles, of, especially for something fairly thick, I marked the line, but when you put it up against the saw blade, you can. It, there's not a line for you to line up to the saw blade itself. You can eyeball it, and you probably get it close enough, especially for this work, for this rough end cut. But I'm using a saddle, what's it called, saddle square, and it's, it's just a right angle, and it lays up pretty nice. You line up your line on one leg, and it wraps it around 90 degrees. And nice and straight about it. it helps you give you a line and sure enough I needed that to move over okay nope that's the wrong side the waist is on this side all right here we go
So now I've adjusted the blade to cut five and a half inches. It's really a tad less. Uh, a one by six is technically three quarters by five and a half inches, but even then they come in a little less than five and a half, and it's actually five and seven sixteenths, which is what I dialed in. Not that you'll be able to see it from two stories up. Um, we're gonna go ahead and trim this to five and a half inches. Um, it's kind of just for aesthetic reasons because right now the way this is set up when it fits against the R panel siding it covers the large major ridge that's this I, I know I know this is the this big gap here is is to fit over a ridge I could you could technically leave it the problem with that of course is aesthetically it it might look like it's a little wider on one side but I don't think it'd be that noticeable, but you know woodworkers. Oh, while I got this up here, here's one of the horizontal pieces. Due to the beauty of our panel geometry, notice that the runners, the ridges, of course, are running vertical, and the horizontal piece has multiple, um, let's call them segments, that fit over. Of course, here's the carve out for the major ridges and then the two minor ridges. It's going to fit exactly where it needs to fit. This is long enough where hopefully. No matter what segment it rests in, I'll have enough room to cover the uh, the outer frame, the vertical outer frames. If not, I'll have to purchase and order an even longer one. But I believe four segments should be long enough for even your worst luck at choosing your cutout locations. We'll give it a try. Okay, here I am on the outside of the cutout but of course I'm so close to it on the scaffolding I can I'm trying to give you a good bearing of what you're looking at I don't have the top horizontal piece on yet I'm about to here's our vertical and um, here's I'm doing a fit check for this lower horizontal piece again it can only fit in certain locations based on the segments of the uh, R panel design. Fortunately, I overlap just a little bit, just enough though. So I'll be making a straight cut right here and on the other side, right there. And so uh, I believe for a 30 inch wide cutout, which is about what this is, a um, detail part like such as this piece here with four segments each segment is it's 12 inches from major ridge to major ridge uh, generally it should fit every time uh, theoretically there's a gapping condition here i'm going to try to figure out what the problem is looks like this is a little low but we'll fix that in a minute Okay, here's the top horizontal frame detail temporarily in place and it's sitting in the segment, R panel segments and it overhangs just a little bit on one side and about six inches on the other and that's good enough. So all I have to do is mark it where to make the cut on both sides I'm on a ladder here so this is why it's so shaky here and I'll be making those cuts and we'll put this temporarily up I'm going to cut the horizontal frame pieces to length and it dawned on me, if everything's perfect, if the building was perfectly...
this dark brown color, I think it's going to work out real well against this lighter tan color on the outbuilding here. So it's going to be a good looking frame. And uh, I'm going to let it dry and then we'll uh, clamp them up into position and we'll start fastening the frames in both the inboard and the outboard frames together. And something else I want to do while I've got my frames down here on the floor, I want to go ahead, I did not do this with the first exhaust frame, um, but I want to do it now. I want to drill some pilot holes. Um, usually I like to get it into place and just drill the pilot holes while it's in place, but uh, I ran into problems with the first exhaust frame when I was, I lost track of where the where the major ridges were falling and I and several t times I ended up drilling along this slope. Now drilling along the this minor ridge slope is no big deal. I, I didn't have any problems with that. But if when you drill in this major ridge slope, your fastener, uh, your drill bit will hit that metal siding that's sandwiched between your wood frames and it will try to ride down that slope and if you're pushing hard enough, you will break your bit. I broke two bits uh, trying to put in that first exhaust frame. So to, to preclude from doing that again, I want to, I'm going to go ahead and drill my pilot holes. And I, I can get pretty close to the edge, uh, but without, going, without drilling into the actual slope itself. You know, it's always uh, debatable on how many fasteners do you put in for any particular item that you're installing. Generally, for construction, uh, for instance, when you put plywood up, uh, in, in, for instance, in my shop here, let me show you. I've got, uh, if you see beyond those cabinets there, I've got French cleats along a plywood interior wall here. I put up studs on the inside of my workshop and uh, put up insulation and uh, installed a uh, plywood four by eight sheets of plywood so I got an eight foot interior wall where I was able to put French cleats up um, I'm not a carpenter I had to look up the specs generally around the periphery of plywood you go every six inches on the inside of the plywood they want you to keep a pitch of about 12 inches per between fasteners minimum. Uh, in smaller items like this, it's more of a uh, what seems right. Uh, you gotta use common sense. Uh, keep in mind also that these are not really st structural items. They're not holding anything up. The exhaust fan will be sitting on the lower frames and uh, they'll be attached to the upper frames, but in reality, uh, exhaust fans can be hung on a bare metal frame there. So this is just um, icing on the cake when it comes to structural uh, uh, integrity of the, of the structure there. So what you do want, though, is enough fasteners where you close up any gaps. You don't want, like, just, say, just two fasteners. It, it won't close up, and you'll have a gapping condition that would allow water to come in and... It, it, it could be a problem later on. So generally what I like is a, at least five fasteners. And the, I like the odd number because I can place the first one uh, right in the middle and then uh, <clears throat> I got two on either side so it's easy to get the spacing out. In this case, however, especially these horizontal pieces, I want at least two fasteners for every segment. So it's going to be one, two, one, two, one, two, and then one for these partial segments here. So these are going to have at least seven fasteners. These may, may have five or six, so I'll have to see what happens. Generally, I like to put my first fastener no more than two inches from the end. Uh, I like to, you want to give yourself plenty of edge distance or you could split the wood. Uh, so give yourself at least an inch, but I like to start about one and a half to two inches away on either end and then a center fastener and then at least one or two in between. In this case it might be about 
I don't know, about six fasteners and same here. These would have at least seven fasteners. It'd be two for each of these and then one at least for the tip here. I won't go with a minimum number of fasteners because I can always add more later after I install it, after I take a look. If I see a gap in condition that needs to be pulled down, I can always add some fasteners. Uh, again, the beauty of doing it now with the pilot holes uh, is I'm, I'll be able to avoid these major ridge slopes. Okay, I got some bigger C-clamps uh, that reached a little further. Some of these reach, well, some reach a little beyond midway, which is great. One day, somebody will invent the magical C-clamp that has an infinite reach. <laughs> I don't know why we can't get C-clamps with deeper throats, other than the fact I know that it's easy to ruin them when you over-tighten them. But anyway, this worked up real well. Um, the uh, butt gaps closed up real well. Uh, the, the interior frame is a lot flatter now. And um, now I'll go around to the outside and start putting in fasteners. Okay, I've kind of reclamped some areas, got some C-clamps on there. And it looks like when it's pulled down, I'm using uh, this little caliper here at two and one quarter inch. That's how long the fastener would go. And of course you don't want it breaking out the opposite side. And it looks like it would grab enough meat both directions. Going from this side, I might want to go a tad longer if I had the fasteners. Of course, being flathead, I one of the problems I have is make sure I don't bury the head so deep that it does break out on the other side. So anyway, it looks like fastener lengths of about two and one quarter would be perfect in most cases here. Now I do want to point out, you see these this major ridge in the, in the siding of the building? Since I did not use a formed IML uh, piece due to the insulation and the chicken wire material i just went flat against it what you what i don't want to do is put a fastener in this in this region the reason being it's not supported you pull down on the fastener i could easily crack the frame here so again i don't want to crack the frame so i'm going to try to stay away from the major ridges I'm, I'm saying it out loud so I will remember not to put a fastener not only in this crown area but even on the side here I'm afraid uh, for one thing I might crack it and the other is you'll have a, a gapping condition where the fastener is not really pulling up that well I, so anyway uh, I'm going to try to go in the, this meaty area even in these minor ridges I think would be okay it's so thick with the filler it's not going to crack or anything so Anyway, uh, I'm going to go to the outside. I'll show you pictures and... Ah! <laughs> Don't want to drop that puppy. You want these flush, not only aesthetic, for aesthetic purposes, but... Um, and I don't want anything to get hung up while I'm trying to install that fan. Um, I didn't push real hard because I'm trying to film myself drilling the hole at the same time. So I don't have very good leverage here. And sure enough, I've rounded that out. But it should stay there. Um, be sure to use your... 
oh, I forget the name of it, the, the clutch or the fastener strength. Uh, you don't want these fasteners going too deep. Uh, all these drills nowadays, of course, have these settings, usually numerical digits. Mine is around eight. The longer the faster, the more strength you need. But you don't want to keep this uh, setting real high such that you can accidentally, you want it to release the, the, the load on the fastener whenever the fastener starts going deep into the wood. If it goes too deep, you will pop out on the other side and you just have an ugly fastener fit. So you want to avoid that, of course. And here's the finished product uh, before the exhaust fan is slipped in. Um, I'm real happy with the results. Uh, there's a little bit of mismatch, as you can see, on uh, some of the connections there at the butt joints between the frame details. But uh, considering that this uh, R-panel siding has so many ridges, I'm, I'm happy that it got this close. I now have a flat surface that I'll be able to slide the fan against and put the uh, flange connections around. I'll be uh, sealing it afterwards and I think I'll have a real nice uh, rain tight connection there. Dice el señor que se le están comiendo sus plantas los conejos. Yeah, I still need to build the little cages I have to build. Okay, one more time. Oh, okay. okay. So. This is bottom, so that's top. Okay. So, we, so this is bottom and this top. Right. Okay. okay, it should go right in there. Yes. But and I'm, I measured it over and over again. You ready? Oh, yeah. You tell me, okay. Okay. Like this. You got it? I got it. Up high. Let me see. And then put it there. Okay, see it's square, so we got it. Yeah. Oh yeah. It's there. Look at that. Yeah. Uh -oh, something good. hanging up a little bit. You want to go watch it inside because I yeah, think yeah. maybe it's the, the, the current. Yeah, something, the, something the, might be there, yeah. I'll check. The electricity is wider. Oh, you know, inside. wait, wait. Maybe we just keep it. No, too much. <laughs> okay, yeah, let me check, take a look. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'm older here. Okay. Okay. Okay, it worked. Yeah. Like so uh, I'll finish the rest of these. It's a little bit of a shortage distance up here uh, due to the fact that the gap was larger than it needed to be. So I might put an extra piece of wood in that gap. And but otherwise, I'm real happy. It's going to turn out real good. Afterwards, I'm going to do some additional trim work to hide the screws in the flange here. Oh. But otherwise, it's looking good. So here we are on the inside, of course, looking at the fan. Um, they were over generous with the twin eight and a quarter um, rough opening. Looks like it could have been quite a bit less. One thing I regret not doing is when you put the fan in, it will sit flush to the bottom due to gravity. But I wish we had slid it all the way to one side, and they, we kind of did, I guess, but I wish we had concentrated on making sure we did. Uh, that way you'll maximize the gapping. There's a big gap here at the top, which is the, of course, the split rough opening gapping to slide the thing in, but now since it sits down, the entire tolerance buildup is right there. And on the other side, I have a gap on this right-hand side because we did kind of push it off more to the left. So, being a woodworker, and I'm also an aerospace engineer, I don't like gapping conditions, uh, both for strength. Uh, also, there's a short edge distance condition on the outside with the flange. I, I put one fastener in, just to be sure it doesn't fall out. Uh, I put one fastener in the middle of each one of these. The sides and the bottom are fine, but this is such a large gap that I, we're within half an inch of the edge. Uh, so I'm going to put some filler, a wood filler, in and, and glue it in best I can. I might be able to tack it in with some pneumatic nails. But anyway, I want something 
semi-structural to so that if the fasteners do break out of the short edge distance it'll, there'll be wood there and not air so anyway i've got a i'm going to cut wood filler for the top and wood filler for this right hand side it fortunately it measured right at 0.75 it's three quarters of an inch gap here so i can use standard uh, plywood and same thing on this side it's three eighths a little bit smaller uh, but again it, a standard plywood I, you can purchase is three eighths so they're each about two and a half inches deep and so um, it'll be easy to cut and I'll, I'll be filling that in okay i got my shims cut here's the very first one um, i've got it's about five sixteenths thick plywood plywood comes in such unusual and different thicknesses based on the manufacturer and the day they manufacture it i guess you always got to check it uh, same thing here here's the second shim um, you get a little bit thinner down here down here i had to use quarter inch and uh and it barely <laughs> it barely fits but anyway i'm gonna cover them with sealant on both sides and squish it on in there uh, again it isn't really necessary it just makes me feel better that i filled the gaps uh, i don't have a place for water to ingress into the building in real life if this was a highly visible area like in your dining room sticking it into your dining room here you would put up molding a uh, nice good looking molding or or some kind of nice design uh, to close off and hide the gap and make an interesting uh, frame there but in this case I'm going to leave it open because if there is a problem such as leaking or whatever uh, I want to be able to see it easily so there's no need to make it beautiful for my workshop uh, here we are outside uh, just a reminder for one thing be sure to use uh, pan head or protruding head fasteners uh, not countersunk not the uh, flush head fasteners uh, the reason being this is a metal flange that doesn't have room to countersink and if you use a flush head fastener um, it, it's not going to hold as well it'll only hold around the holes and then chances of a tear out are pretty high uh, instead use a protruding head uh, here's a craig tight fastener they have a nice big head on them with a kind of a built-in washer and I'm going ahead and adding an additional washer um, for a number eight fastener um, just to give it a bigger surface area and diminish the chance of of tearing out it, and another reason is I increased the length from two and a quarter to two and a half inches two and a half I'm afraid is a little bit too deep but adding the washer pulls the grip length back just enough where it doesn't tear out on the other side so anyway there's several reasons I'm using these washers and uh, and uh, it, there's it, it, it kind of helps it structurally so anyway oh another thing is be sure you use fasteners that are um, certified for treated lumber uh, I know the blue Craig fasteners are treated are for treated lumber um, there's some fasteners that uh, can uh, deteriorate due to the chemicals in treated lumber and you don't want that happening so be sure to double check that okay I got all the fasteners in and technically you could leave it like this but I'm gonna beautify it some more and it'll add some security a really bad guy could get on a ladder undo these screws and take the fan out and sneak into my workshop uh, I doubt that would happen but and another thing is it just looks kind of I don't know bad to have the flashing the, these flanges shown along with the fastener heads I'll go ahead and use their trim kit and it's already got a rabbit that's two and a quarter inches which is what we need to clear this flange and it's only four inches wide which gives a cool looking step to your frame and now one of the final assembly steps uh, we're going to put in some trim uh, to hide the flanges and, and 
screws that go into the flange on the outside. Uh, you can purchase this Hazlitt product. Uh, actually, it comes longer. I meant to show this to you before I cut it. Uh, it's lumber that's, that is treated. It's one inch, an actual one inch by four inch wide. And it's got a rabbit already cut in it, a, a slot, if you will. And what that allow us to do is frame around the fan with, a, with this rabbit just enough to clear the flange and the fasteners under it. Um, again, that flange was a little over two inches and sure enough, you can order the rabbit with two and one eighth inches, uh, but be sure to measure it carefully with your fan before you order uh, anything. The, uh, you have to cut it yourself, of course, and I decided to use a 45 degree miter butt joints at the corner to kind of make it look good, hopefully. And uh, so anyway, we'll install that now. Uh, before we do that, I'm gonna go ahead and drill the pilot holes. I'm gonna go ahead and put just three fastener holes. These, uh, this last piece of trim is fairly easy to uh, fabricate because the inside length It'll be exactly the same as the measured uh, rough opening. So we'll go like that and got about an inch and a half overlap. It, it's a good looking step of a frame, so yeah, it looks good. It worked out on my other exhaust fan also. I'm going to do the top first so that any tolerance build up I can handle on the lower section here a little easier. There we have it. We have that final trim. It hides the fastener and the flange, which it gives you a little bit of a security measure. Oh, be sure it doesn't affect your shutters. I did. That's why you don't want it to overlap too much. Looks like everything's going to work out great. Uh, I might do a little touch-up paint job. Uh, well, before that, I'm going to get some caulking and uh, go around the upper edge especially and down the sides because uh, I don't want any kind of water leak during the rain but otherwise this is just about finished up. Taking down the blue tape, here's the last piece. Worked out pretty well. The uh, caulking uh, filled my <laughs> butt joints that didn't quite close up. Um, painted it. The blue tape protected the, the places I didn't want to get painted. Um, one thing you want to check, be sure your shutters are still good. Be sure to take off any paint or especially sealant that dripped on your shutters. Uh, you want them to be as light as possible. If they're heavy, they'll, they'll reduce the efficiency of your exhaust fan because it takes a little bit more power to open up that particular shutter. And they won't all, they, since they work together, they won't all open to their maximum. So be sure to keep them light. Be sure there's nothing scraping or touching the edges. But otherwise, uh, you have these Hazlitt product um, form-fitting frames work real well. 
and uh, it's a good looking uh, finish and very structurally sound. I'm, I hope you learned something from this video. Thank you. And here's the final product running. Again, this is a Max Air 24 inch fan that I just installed in my steel building. Um, it seems to be a little bit loud. I, again, I can't compare it to anything. I, this is my first exhaust fan. But um, it would be nice if there was a noise level that you could compare fans uh, with a noise level comparison because uh, this could be detrimental to my usual practice of playing music while I'm working in the shop. I can already tell i got to turn the volume up a little bit more. But with this Texas heat, it's going to be nice to have this fan and I'm going to put another one in left of that so I'll have two of these. Um, I may not have to run them both all the time, but it'd be, it'll be nice to have to circulate the air.